Painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer. We'll spend some time in Wisconsin at the Mulberry Farm. Sarah talks with the owner about what life is like there, while Roger uses acrylics to paint one of the many buildings on the property. Traveling in Wisconsin has given us a chance to take some of the back roads, which of course I love. And we've seen many farms, which always are so attractive, we always want to stop and say, could we just look around and see some of your animals? And this place near Sharwood, Wisconsin, is open to the public. So they've invited us to look around, pet the animals, and Roger has found a beautiful barn to paint. I love the severe look of this barn behind me. It sort of gives an Edward Hopper type look. I have with me a 12 by 16 inch piece of masonite covered with gesso, but I wanted to make more of a panoramic view of this. So I just taped off the top here with some blue tape. And when I get back to the studio, I'll just cut that off and I'll have the size panel that I want. I'm using acrylics and I have a full palette of colors today. I have titanium white, ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, transparent Indian yellow, cadmium yellow. For the reds, I have an alizarin crimson, a naphthol red, and I have three earth colors, burnt sienna, burnt umber, yellow ochre, and one green, which is a very opaque chromium oxide green. I made a sketch of this barn a few moments ago in charcoal, and then I went over it in pencil. I can just wipe this charcoal off, and then I'll have my good pencil lines. I did this so I can get a quick start here because we definitely have rain coming in today. I do like painting when it's overcast like this. It gives me a nice flat light, but it's just very comfortable to be outside in a light like this. And as I paint here, unless it starts to rain, the light will pretty much be consistent. In other words, I don't get a lot of changes with shadows and so on. In that way, an overcast day is a fine choice to go out and paint. This farm is open to the public, so we have a lot of children here today looking at the animals, the pigs, the hens, the goats, and the cows. I'm just putting a wash on here right now just to kind of get rid of this white on my board. I'm not really trying to do anything other than just cover the canvas or cover the board with some kind of a tone. I often just will cover the whole board before I start with a tone. Well, I'll let that dry for a few moments and then I'll start with the sky. Very overcast today, as I said, so I'm going to take cerulean blue, some burnt umber, just make a gray color. Now my palette is also gray, a middle tone gray. So as I mix this, I can see by looking at the sky, that is definitely very light. It's not middle tone, it's light. So if I mix this color right here and it matches this gray of my palette, I know that's too dark. So, I have, so I'm going to lighten it. It's one advantage of having a middle tone gray palette. Now I've got this lighter than middle tone and I think that might work for the sky. Maybe even slightly lighter. I'll cut around the roof line here and I put this on very quickly and then I just take my brush and with a light touch, just feather that out so I have a nice smooth tone. And right down here we have a field in the distance, so I'll end the sky about here. This is about where the horizon line is, right in here. I marked that down earlier. With one point perspective, very much simplifies painting process. There is a two point perspective building and that's that small building over here to the far right. I'm not looking straight on at that. I'm looking at an angle. So that becomes two point perspective. Now the roof of this barn is not much darker than the sky, but it is slightly darker. And it could be that later on in the painting, I may need to adjust that just 
to make the painting look better. So with a light touch, I'll just drag my brush down where those panels on the roof fall this way. I'm not concerned with any detail now. Just get my big shapes put in. We have another tree back here. And that's nice because that kind of defines the edge of this little shed over here. I think I'll put the red of the barn in. I have two reds here, my alizarin crimson and a naphthol red. I'm going to use quite a bit of burnt sienna with this. I don't want to get it too bright. So I'll pick up some burnt umber and, uh, and blue and get this a dark color. And I think by starting this with a dark color here, it will afford me the opportunity to put some lighter values over that once this dries. Because I'm using acrylics, I can do that. If I were using oils, uh, I would have to approach this a bit differently. And since these boards all run down vertically here, I'll make my brush strokes go that same direction. I'll do the same up here. We have a window here. I guess I'll cut around that. Boy, those chickens are really loud over there. <laughs> part of being on a farm, isn't it? I didn't bother to draw any detail in here. There isn't much detail in there, but there would be no purpose in drawing a lot of detail in there since I like to block in the large shapes to begin with. It's, it's really like building the foundation of a, the painting to put in the large areas first. Save the details for, for last. I'll pick up my chromium oxide green, some yellow ochre. We'll put in some of the grass. I always find that uh, severe paintings, uh, paintings that look head on at a subject, they have a certain power about them. And I've always been attracted to that. Here we have some more grass coming around this side. And then back here we have the field in the distance. And then right here in the foreground we have this beautiful mowed grass coming right down here. And this makes a nice pattern here because the eye comes in here and then it sort of goes around, points, points to the barn. And I can block this in in a very rough manner because it is grass, so I like the idea of having a lot of texture here, especially in the foreground. As things go in the distance here, they'll flatten out. I won't see nearly as much texture back here as I will close up. Right over here, I have another patch of grass. I'm going to pull it into the painting a little more this way just to help the composition to give this a nice pattern here. So the road splits off, comes this way, and then it splits off this way. I want a real dark color, so I'll take my red, blue, and yellow, my three primary colors. That'll give me a nice dark tone. And then I'll put this door right in here. I'm going to have to go over this a couple of times to make it dark enough, I believe. Some more grass in the distance, way back here. And I want to be sure my horizon line is lined up the same on both sides. I don't want this horizon line to be up here on one side and down here on the other. <laughs> it seldom happens, but it's something I have to pay attention to. We have trees way off in the distance there, and they look to be very blue color, bluish gray. And of course they're light because there's a lot of atmosphere between me and these distant trees, and I want that to have a soft edge back there. Well, this road is a very light color. It's, I think, almost as bright or maybe even brighter than the sky. It's a very yellow ochre-ish look to it. But I'm going to mix some cerulean blue with that. I have to be careful in any painting to keep my colors harmonious. And that's one danger of having so many colors out on the palette. Uh, the more colors that are on the palette, the more opportunity to, there is for the painting to become disharmonious. Because of the weather and everything coming in today, uh, sometimes a few more extra colors on the palette can speed things along. So what I'm saying with that is that if I want to make a burnt sienna color, I can do that with just these three colors of my ultramarine blue, Indian yellow, and alizarin crimson. I can get very, very close to that, to that color of burnt sienna. But just to save some time, I got the burnt sienna out there. One large area 
left to block in is the silo, and that's a very warm color. The, uh, the burnt sienna is a wash. That was a good base color for that. I'll let that dry for a few moments, and then I'll put some other values on the side of that to give it some roundness. The barn is quite dry now. So another layer here of the acrylics. Start laying this over and building different areas of this barn. So I wanted to start with these darks and then lay these lighter tones over it. I could have done it the other way. I could have started with lighter tones and then added the darker tones over that. But generally speaking, starting with the darks first works much better than starting with lights. And I'll keep all these brush strokes going vertically. Just using a flat brush here to do that. Under the eaves, of course, it's always darker. So I'll take this dark color that I used here in the door, just drag some of this down under the eaves. And same goes for the eaves right up in here. I'm going to paint this little window up there. That's a very dark color. And then I'll paint the uh, window frame around that. Now that I have everything covered, I can start in with some of the smaller details of the painting. I'm still going to use a larger flat brush. I don't need to use a real small brush yet since this has a chisel edge. And sometimes the use of a larger brush will actually give a more painterly look as opposed to using a small pointed brush. It's very easy to get too much detail in a painting and it almost tends to ruin the the impact or the essence of the painting to get too much detail. Of course, that's a personal preference too. Now, when I put in large areas such as this, I want to be sure that I keep the large areas intact. I don't want to get too many lights or too many very darks in here to break up that large area. I want to keep that large area as one unit, as one large shape. So the variations I put in between that or inside of that large area had to sort of fall within a range that keeps it keeps this shape together. This flat side of the silo is really bothersome, so see if I can uh, make that look more round. It should be quite easy. I always bring this atomizer with me, a spray atomizer. I can spray that. That will not rejuvenate this paint. Once the acrylics are dry, they're dry but it will help my wet paint here to flow over the dry paint. Just gives it a little lubrication so the uh, wet paint can flow over that dry paint. It actually makes it look like it's, these two colors are being blended. From uh, where I'm standing, the tree is hiding the silo quite a bit, but I don't want to uh, hide the silo in my painting very much. Now with a lighter color, I'm going to put a highlight on the side of the silo. The thing to remember when it's overcast like this, there are not very many highlights anywhere. Everything tends to be very soft and very subtle. This does need to get some form, and it is lighter on that side by quite a bit. So we'll just add a little bit of light there, try and make that look a little more round. Right up here where the, uh, this overhang is, I'm still going to use a large brush, and I'm going to make it lighter than I see it, because I want this to have some contrast between that dark and the light. Could use a smaller brush to do this, but as long as this, this brush has a good chisel point on it, uh, a larger brush will hold more paint, so I can go a little bit further with it than I can with a small brush. So I'm trying to build this painting as I go, a little step by step. So I'm working on one area of the painting, I'm working on another area of the painting, and trying to bring it all to a completion all at once. So I don't want to leave any one area really untouched. So I think I need to uh, address this tree. Now this tree would be a uh, good use for an old beat up brush. And I generally don't recommend a lot of old brushes. And in fact, I don't even have any with me. But I always use a good brush for my main areas, for something that has a sharp edge. But for trees, a brush that's had some wear on it often works very good. I'm using this brush sort of just on the edge. I don't have very much paint on the brush. It's kind of a dry brush. I'm just scumbling some of these areas in here to make this slightly darker. Now I do want this foliage to overlap the silo. And one reason is I like to group all these areas together. In other words, I don't want one big shape here that's sort of off by itself. I like to attach these shapes and it gives the painting some more unity. That sort of connects the tree to the rest of the barn and the rest of the painting. 
I debated whether to even put in this tree, but I did like it. It just adds another point of interest to the piece. Now we have a dark trunk here, and I'm going to use sort of a green color. Bring this down here. Now I don't even have a shadow on the ground from this trunk because of the overcast. But I am going to put a, a slight shadow just to anchor this tree to the ground. And with my sky color, I'll add a few sky holes in here, spaces where that sky is shining through these leaves. This tree in the background here, I'll flip that up into the sky. I'm dragging green up into this silo because there is an influence. Anything on the ground is going to reflect up onto the object next to it. And that will also give it some unity here. So what I do from here on out is about refining everything I've put on here. Now it's all about the detail. I have a nice little tire track coming through here. I'll spray my board and let that paint flow easily. And very carefully, I'll just put tire tracks coming out into the foreground. And as they come this way, of course, they get wider and wider. As they go back, they get smaller, and then eventually they just kind of disappear around the corner here. Now, I have yet to use a small pointed brush throughout this whole painting, and I can stay with this bright as long as I can and keep adding more detail. Now, the edge of this roof is quite dark, but I'm putting more of a highlight right on the edge of it. There are certain things in painting that I change from what I see because I'm hoping that it will improve the painting and improve the, the look and the composition. So I don't always just follow or try and follow what I see out there. I use that as a guide and then I try and convert that along with my feelings about the subject to make as good a painting as I can. And that's why it's often good to take a painting like this and go back into the studio and finish it there because there I kind of leave the subject behind and I concentrate more on the painting and less on what I see here. So that's a little bit of a balancing thing that has to be done and has to be decided with each painting. I don't want this to look totally overcast. I want there to be some sunlight in here and a good place to do that is back here maybe where these fields are. So I'll make some yellow, cerulean blue, make a very light, bright, cheery yellow and we can add some just a touch of sunlight back in that field. This grass is just brilliant up here even on a overcast day. You know, funny thing is sometimes on overcast days colors look more brilliant than on sunny days. The sun sometimes has this effect of washing out the color, whereas in a day like this, uh, it doesn't get a chance to do that. And the colors actually sometimes look more vivid on an overcast day than on a sunny day. All right, I'm going to put down my bright and pick up a small pointed brush and really get down to business with some of the finer points in these details. I've mixed a sort of an orange red here. I'll just drag a few indications of some of the boards. I don't want to put in every board here. Uh, this is not a photograph, it's a painting, so I want to suggest these and indicate them. And possibly by just putting in a few of them, it will certainly give the idea that the whole thing is made up in the same manner. Now, if your thing is painting every board and painting every detail, that's fine too. There's certainly nothing wrong with that at all. The way I like to paint is, is this method. So everybody really has to work out their own system of what they like to do and what they like to see and what they like to paint, how much detail and so on. I've always admired the painters that can, with a few strokes, give me the idea that there's a lot of detail in there when actually there isn't. You know, one or two strokes will suggest something. And it's for me, it's beautiful to look at a painting that has those few well-placed strokes that give the whole story and not too much of it. It's always easy to keep going and going with a painting and it's difficult to know when to quit. It's always an issue with every painter, including myself. My guideline for that is generally when I don't know what else to do with a painting, uh, I generally stop. 
because if I keep going, I try and push myself somewhat, but if I keep going, the painting will sometimes, or often, become worse rather than better. So it's very tricky, but uh, knowing when to quit is a, a tricky but important thing to learn. Now the roof on this barn is immaculate, as is the rest of the farm, but in order to give it some extra, little extra character, I'm going to put a few little rusty spots on the barn. I hope the farm doesn't object here. Just drag a few areas right down in there, just to give it the look of uh, maybe a little bit of rust dripping off the edge there. And I'll make the bottom part of this roof slightly lighter to give it even more variation right down here. I do see a small path coming down from here. I'm going to put a little suggestion of that in. And again, with one or two strokes, that might just indicate that. And that also gives a real indication of the slope of the land. Got one here. This sort of echoes that. So I'm going to stop this painting at this point and bring it back into the studio after I take some reference photographs and we'll finish the painting there. I'm sitting here with Bonnie Keys, who is one of the owners of Mulberry Lane Farm. How did Mulberry Lane Farm get its name? Well, it's actually named after a 100-year-old mulberry tree that still stands on the property here at the farm. <laughs> and I know that much of the reason that the farm exists is to have animals here and to allow visitors of all ages, especially children, to be able to get up close to the animals and learn about them, touch them. You have a petting area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All of our guests have the opportunity to milk a cow, ride a pony for the children, a hay ride. They go into the chicken coop to catch a chicken, pig pen to pet a pig, they hand feed the goats, the sheep. It's very interactive, very hands-on, but more importantly, we try to make it educational. Yes. Well, as far as hands-on goes, Roger wants to paint that barn, of course. He's been working on that. And what is the history of that barn? And I know it says granary and hay mow. Yes. Well, the house was built in 1881, and actually the hay mow was built before it. So it's over 100 years old, and when we purchased the property, it had hay in it stacked to the ceiling and estimated that some of the hay was over 30 years old. It's a huge barn. It yes. must have held um, hundreds of bales of hay. It did. It's a 4,000 square foot barn that sits on top of the dairy barn. So of course the cows were down below. Hay was stored upstairs and they would open up the hatch and drop the hay down to feed the cows. I've noticed that some of the animals here are quite spectacular. One in particular comes to mind and he weighs about 950 pounds. Yes, Champ. He's kind of the farm mascot, you could say. He's quite an attraction. He is a boar, meaning he's a male pig. And typically he probably wouldn't live out his life if he was at a sow farm, but here he's come to retire. How old is he? How, how long did it take to get to be 950 pounds? Well, actually, pigs grow very fast. They're only two to three pounds when they're born, and then as they're growing, they can grow about a pound a day. And Really? Yeah, so our, our teen pigs, when they go to market at 250 pounds, they're not that that old, just months old, practically. Oh, gosh. Yes, I... but Champ is about four years old, and like I said, he's already 950 pounds. The big attraction is the fall pumpkin picking because all of our farm guests get to visit the pumpkin patch to pick their own free pumpkin. So fall really comes alive in um, the month of October with over 10,000 visitors just that month alone. Mm -hmm. So it's their chance to bring their families now to a farm and have that same wonderful experience that they had growing up. Yeah, well that makes good sense because a lot of things are of the past now, but here it sounds like you could spend the whole day here and have a picnic and um, just pretty much do whatever you wanted, pet the animals. Well, I'm going to take a walk around and look in some of the buildings and um, show you some of the things that are hiding behind the doors. <laughs> mm. 
Well, now I'm back in the studio. So the tree was sparse. So I bulked it up and added some sky holes and it looked full, but not really solid. The light was overcast and soft that day, but a highlight on the side of the sidle gave it more form. The barn, of course, is the center of interest, so it needed more going on in it in that large area. So a bright cadmium red added the accents to the boards, breaking up that rather large, simple red shape. It also gave it the character of a weathered look. And these are really the fun parts of a painting, and just a few strokes can make or break a painting. Details were added to the windows, and just below that, very subtle indications were added of what might look like machinery inside that dark area. A few more details were placed in here and there just to tie things together. I felt that the road needed more description, so a few more patches of grass were added, along with a uh, cast shadow from that tree that served to break up the diagonal of the road with a few horizontal lines. A strong patch of sunlight on the road helped to bring the eye back towards the barn and away from that foreground. That little path from the top of the hill, it was accentuated and a few soft highlights were added in the foreground. I finished it with several fence posts. I was careful not to put in a lot more detail to the composition because often adding too much to a painting will take away from the overall effect rather than add to it. So, I'll sign it and consider this one finished. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.